All right. Thank you guys so much for being here with Neuroboxing today for our wellness series. Um, we are here with um, Claire McLean, who is um, a physical therapist, and she's the owner of Rogue uh, PT and Wellness in Orange County, California. Um, so I'm just going to real quickly, I'm going to tell them a little bit about you, Claire, okay? Sure. Um, so Claire um, has a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from the University of Michigan, a doctorate in physical therapy from USC, and she did her neurologic residency for USC and Rancho Los Amigos. Um, it was during her, her physical therapy residence that she found her passion for working with individuals with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. Um, her physical therapy education at USC exposed her to the potential for activity-dependent neuroplasticity for individuals with Parkinson's. She also, one of her mentors was Dr. Beth Fisher, who was a pioneer in physical therapy and exercise research. Um, and then, um, skip a little bit, exposure to these pioneering concepts like with uh, Parkinson wellness recovery um, demonstrated that people with Parkinson's could improve through intensive aerobic and skill-based exercise. In her 10 plus practical years working with clients, she's experienced the amazing improvements that are possible for the Parkinson community. So I'm gonna hand it over to Claire and she's gonna to present today on brain health for neurological conditions. Take it away. All right, thank you so much um, for having me and thank you all for coming today. It's really um, pretty cool actually. There's a lot of silver linings I think that have occurred with this pandemic um, that although there's a lot of negatives and challenges, um, it also allows for some connection um, that maybe we wouldn't have taken the opportunity to do before. So it's really fun to meet with all of you, even though we're all pretty much most of us maybe in Southern California, with me being down in Orange County and you guys maybe being up in LA or in Ventura County. Otherwise, we might not have interacted before. So it's really great to meet all of you and be here. Um, and yeah, just to add to that kind of the bio, basically I am a physical therapist um, but I'm a physical therapist who does not stay in her lane um, in terms of just exercise and physical therapy or even just physical therapy. Um, what I have seen over my career is that there are so many, for people with Parkinson's, there are so many things that can be helpful. Exercise is one of the most important things in my opinion, but there's so many other things that can be helpful. And I'm really interested in all of those things and being able to educate my clients and share things with them, share resources um, to help people just have the best, you know, possible opportunities to live well with Parkinson's. Um, and it's just pretty amazing what is possible. So I have been fortunate to work in traditional settings, but then also try to push the boundaries of, you know, what people get access to and see the benefits um, for people when they have better and more consistent access to things like therapy and exercise and then all this other education. So um, I really love all of this and hopefully it'll um, probably there'll be some things that are kind of things that you've heard before, um, maybe some repeats, but I do think with exercise research, the more we hear some of the same things, the better and hearing it from another person. Um, I know all of you hear so much from your instructors. If you attend neuroboxing classes and from Jennifer, she's such a wealth of information. Um, so this might not be brand new for you, but hopefully you kind of get re-inspired. And I think that's one thing that I've experienced with the pandemic too is that, you know, the longer we're exercising from home, although it's great to have Zoom classes, it's not the same as getting together in person with our friends. Um, and that I found with our classes, we kind of need to do something new and fresh or like get re-inspired each month that, that has, this has gone on a little bit longer to say, okay, why am I exercising from home? Why am I pushing myself when I could just as easily not or, you know, binge some TV or not do as much exercise? So hopefully some of this kind of re-inspires you to push yourself again, make sure that you're exercising as consistently as possible and kind of be excited about what is possible. So I'm going to share my screen now with a presentation. So I'll give my, me a moment to do that. And I need to put it into presentation mode. 
so that you guys don't see a bunch of extra text around it. Um, so I do have the chat window up. Um, I will do my best to keep an eye on that if you guys have any questions. Um, as we go along, feel free to ask those questions as we go. Um, you could also save them for the end. I'm doing my best to keep the talk not too long and have time for questions at the end as well and more discussion. Um, and then Jennifer, if you see anything that I am missing, please feel free to jump in and let me know if there's any questions. So my name is Claire. Um, after working in more traditional settings um, in a hospital-based out based outpatient therapy program where I saw that people could get better with physical therapy, but I also saw the limitations um, with ins the insurance-based system where people often have a very limited amount of physical therapy that is offered um, through insurance. And while very beneficial, the thing is like people with Parkinson's cannot exercise you know, two times a week with a therapist for six to eight weeks and expect that to change their brain. We are just starting to make those changes at that time frame, and people need ongoing access to exercise and things change over time. You may feel better at times and you need to increase and challenge yourself more. There may be times where you feel worse, maybe after an illness or an injury and you need to adjust your program down. And so you, people need consistent access to exercise. And when I was working at this hospital, I started working there about 10 years ago. And at the time, there were hardly any classes in the community. There were not, um, you know, neuroboxing may have been getting started. Jennifer, I don't know exactly when you started with your classes. Um, down in Orange County, there are some rock steady boxing classes. None of those existed 10 years ago. I think rock steady boxing as an organization was just getting started. Power, Parkinson Wellness Recovery that I work closely with, they were just getting started. Um, LSVT Big, which is a physical therapy protocol, was pretty early in its development in terms of training more therapists. So there really was not a lot of physical or other healthcare professionals outside of neurologists who specialized in Parkinson's, and there were not a lot of options for classes in the community. So luckily, um, where I worked, um, the hospital where I worked, we got to start classes so that after people did one-on-one -on -one therapy, they could continue and exercise classes and really try to maintain or even continue to improve over time. And we were actually testing people every two months. Well, that was a lot of testing. We don't test that often anymore. But every two months we were testing a few things. And what we saw is over the course of almost two years of doing classes, people were getting better over time instead of worse. And with Parkinson's, you know, it's a progressive um, neurologic condition. That's not what is supposed to happen, especially over the longer term, like from one year to the next. And so that was very exciting to see. Um, and we were, you know, sharing that information. More people wanted to join our classes. And unfortunately, there are, you know, there were limitations in, you know, the amount of time that we could spend doing classes um, based on when we had access to the room at the hospital and staffing and all these other things. And so as I tried to add more classes because I saw how important it was for people to have these ongoing classes, and I also really enjoy teaching classes and working with people over the longer term, um, but as I tried to get more classes, we just kind of ran into roadblocks that often can happen in systems where you're not necessarily able to do everything that you want to do or that you think is important or that you know helps people. So that's when I left and started my own business, um, Rogue PT and Wellness, to be able to offer more ongoing access to exercise, including classes, some one-on-one -on -one wellness, education, all those things that are important and be able to offer that on an ongoing basis in our community. Um, and then with the pandemic, we had to move everything online as well. And so now I've started an online membership too um, called Rogue in Motion. And it, for one, just functions as, as a video library. So all of my clients down here, we have about 100 members at our gym. For a long time, I've wanted to record videos and put them online so that they could exercise from home or use them when traveling. And so finally, we're doing that. So that's another one of our uh, silver linings. So full disclosure, though, um, I'm going to show some videos after this. And like I've been told by Facebook, um, I have to be careful in how I share those because the results are not typical. So we are seeing people get better over even the course of years. Um, and I'm not saying that we're curing Parkinson's. People definitely still have challenges. Um, they're living with Parkinson's and that definitely comes with ups and downs. But overall, based on their experience of Parkinson's and based on our objective testing, we are showing that people can actually get better and maintain those benefits over long periods of time. Um, so I'm going to show you some videos now because this is really why I do this and why I feel like, you know, an exercise evangelist kind of to go out there and try to spread the word as much as possible, get as many people as possible exercising, try to educate neurologists so that they encourage people because the results are so dramatic and it's really amazing what people can do. 
Well, let's see. Well, let me forward to the next. Okay. So this is the first case. So this is a gentleman named Dennis who I started working with originally back in 2011. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2001. So he has now been diagnosed for 19 years, um, almost 20 coming up on that anniversary. He was initially referred to physical therapy because he was experiencing freezing and festinating. Um, and that was in 2011. So it was about 10 years after being diagnosed. He um, was treated with medications. He had actually had deep brain stimulation surgery, which was very effective for him. Um, and that was in 2008. But three years later, he was starting to experience more challenges with freezing and festinating. So he finally was referred to physical therapy. Um, that's one of my uh, things that I feel very strongly about is that people should be referred to physical therapy very early in their diagnosis to get started on a plan, start assessing things, you know, and so that you have a physical therapist that you can be in touch with as things come up and you have questions. Um, even if you're exercising a lot in the community, physical therapists can add another dimension um, to your kind of approach and your plan. So he finally got referred to physical therapy. And um, we had about 12 sessions that were approved by insurance. But then luckily, right when he was finishing his one-on-one -on -one therapy was when we were starting our classes. And because walking is his, was his main goal of what he wanted to be able to do better, one of the classes we had was a cardio class. Um, so really taking the research, looking at people walking on treadmills or using uh, stationary bikes for exercise, that aerobic exercise component, we were trying to basically take that research and complete it in the, you know, do it in the real world as similarly as possible to what the research was showing was effective. So there are multiple studies, um, and now there's even more than back when we started this, showing that walking on a treadmill is a really good form of exercise, not only for aerobic exercise and getting the heart rate up, but also because you really can retrain walking. So from our perspective, we are always looking at, you know, kind of exercise for the purpose of exercise, getting your heart rate up, getting stronger. But with Parkinson's, we are also looking at training or retraining skills. So things that are affected by Parkinson's, your mobility, maybe getting in and out of a car or moving around in bed or getting up and down from the ground, the functional things that are challenging throughout the day, we want to actually retrain those things so that they can be easier and more efficient and better. And so your whole life is better, not just that you can exercise well, but that that exercise really translates to the rest of your life. So this video of Dennis on the left, you'll see um, the camera work is not great because while I was watching him, he's freezing and festinating a little bit and the noise that was like squeaking on the treadmill. And so I was a little nervous, like, okay, do I need to be there to make sure he's safe? So that's why the camera work is a little sloppy. Um, but I'll just back up again so you can watch that a little closer on the left. So he's freezing and festinating. He is then able to work out of it and take a bigger step, but he's holding on. You can see he's holding on really hard. At one point, he is, even has to step to the side of the treadmill because he's not able to take that longer step. Um, and then basically he started participating in that class. So he was coming to uh, the hospital three days a week, walking on the treadmill for about 40 minutes. And for there were months where he, at the last 10 minutes of his time on the treadmill, he would freeze and festinate and it would be noisy. There was squeaking. I wasn't sure if he was just going to get better at festinating on the treadmill, if we were kind of training that, or if he was actually going to be able to break out of it. And it took somewhere between three and four months, actually, of him walking consistently three days a week, every week, um, three to four months later, all of a sudden he stopped festinating on the treadmill. And now almost, you know, now almost seven or yeah, seven years after that video, um, he doesn't festinate on the treadmill anymore. So you can see the video in the middle is from 2017. Um, he's not walking there because that was a shorter clip, but there he's walking again. And then on the right, that's from 2019. You can see for one, he has lost weight. He is healthier. He's able to walk without holding on. His balance is better. He's turning and looking out the window over to the side. That indicates his balance is better. And then his walking is better. He still has days where he's slow and stiff. Um, you know, his walking doesn't always look that good, but it pretty much always is better than it was in 2013. And that is not supposed to happen for people with Parkinson's. You are not supposed to be better, you know, seven years later. So I think it's pretty exciting. Um, and working with people like this who, you know, do really exercise consistently, and now I've worked with them for so long, you know, I feel very confident in being able to tell people what is possible. Um, but then it is important what you do for exercise, how you do it. There's a lot of factors that make a difference. Um, but 
what the first thing I think to show the most important is just to show what is possible and hopefully inspire people. And the more of you who, you know, get inspired by Dennis and say, I'm going to do more exercise. I'm going to push myself more. I'm going to exercise more consistently. I'm going to exercise not only on the days that I go to class, but on the days that I don't go to a class. Um, and maybe add something to your exercise program. So I know straight aerobic exercise on a treadmill and bike is not people's favorite exercise. It is kind of boring. Um, you may not have access, especially right now with not being able to go to a gym. Um, but there is a reason why there is so much exercise or so much research that supports it. It is really a an excellent way to exercise um, in a somewhat controlled environment to be able to build up your endurance, to do things safely. Um, here at our gym, we actually have some harnesses hung from the ceiling over treadmills. So even people who have a pretty significant um, balance deficit are able to walk safely on the treadmill and the harness is there. If they lose their balance, it catches them. And what we see when people are allowed to spend the time walking is how much better they can get. Um, so, you know, hopefully this is inspiring to you. Um, watching these videos, even though I work with him and I see it happen, it's still just, it's so exciting to me to see that. So I do see a question of how fast is he walking? So he is right around 2.0 is kind of his, 2.0 miles per hour is his comfortable speed. Um, recently, before we had to take our classes online, he was actually pushing himself up to 2.5 miles per hour. So on the treadmill, what I would say the first most important thing is safety and quality of walking. So we will sometimes slow the treadmill way down if that means that people can take nice big steps and stride out. Because you know, if you're walking fast but it's out of control or you're taking small steps, that's not retraining your brain for what we need it to be able to do better. So we definitely start with the treadmill on the slower side where people can take really good big steps. And then over time, we increase that speed. Um, and sometimes it depends on the day of the week, how fast someone is walking. That quality of walking is the most important and building up endurance. And then over time, we wanna build up speed. And there are some ways that we can um, set goals for walking on the treadmill. So there are, based on your age and whether you're male or female, there are what's considered an age norm for a lot of things like walking. So they'll take a population of you know, men in there from 70 to 75 and they will test a group of hundreds of men in that age range. And then they'll come up with the average and they'll say, this is kind of normal for a man in this age range. So you know, things are different depending on what age someone is, if they're a man or a woman, height matters, um, things like that. But we can still get an estimate and say, okay, if you're this age and you're a man, ideally you should be able to walk about this speed and that should be comfortable. And then we also know what is like the fastest that you should be able to walk safely based on your age. And so on the treadmill, we can say, okay, this is the speed it requires, you know, that you need to be able to cross a crosswalk safely or to be able to access the community. So we have, there's a lot of data that guides us in knowing what speed someone should be able to walk. So um, another example I'm going to show in a minute, Terry, um, she, we did her assessment when, um, one of every, we do assessments every six months and we were doing her testing. She was also walking around kind of the two to 2.0 mile per hour. That was comfortable for her. And we looked at her age and as, um, for kind of the age norm for her was to be able to walk about three miles per hour and the fastest possible for her age, she should be able to walk up to four miles per hour in, you know, in a short distance, not necessarily that you walk a really long distance at that high speed. Um, but when you need to be able to pick up the pace, you want to be able to pick up the pace and do that safely. So, you know, she was walking at 2.2 and we both thought like, oh, 3.0 is kind of fast and 4.0 is really fast. That's twice as long. That's twice as fast as how fast you're walking right now. That seems kind of fast, like a lot. And then I think she, you know, but she was walking on the treadmill in classes and I think it only took a month and she had gotten up to 4.0 miles per hour. So this is where, you know, some of that knowledge of knowing like, what is kind of average for a person in my age? What might I be looking to be able to do? And then setting a goal and working towards it. Even if you're starting at 2.0, you know, first, then you go up to 2.1 and then 2.2, you work your way up slowly. And what I find with people is, you know, if they stay consistent and stick with it, I don't think yet I've had someone who wasn't able to like reach that next goal of what they wanted to be able to do. Um, so, I mean, Dennis is still working on taking long steps. His brain and body do want to take slightly shorter steps, but because he is consistently working against that on the treadmill, you know, holding on when needed, that also helps a lot with being able to take, um, long steps. 
he's been, he's able to do really well. Um, so that was a, a brief, that was a quick question and I'm not good at giving quick answers. So sorry, that's way more information than you were looking for. Um, another point I wanna make, so I'm showing him here walking outside over ground is that, you know, some people might think, well, walking on a treadmill is only gonna help you get good at walking on a treadmill. And that is not true. We see a very good generalization to better walking off a treadmill. So here you can see these two videos are two years apart. This is during his assessment. And one thing um, that is important uh, in terms of, what was I gonna say? Um, oh, I totally blanked on that. Oh yeah, now I remember what it was. So our assessments, we do our assessments at the same time of day when we test people so that we are trying to control as much as possible for medication effects. Because uh, you know a lot of you might know that um, over time, sometimes medications don't, it's not that they don't work quite as well, but there are some changes that can happen with medication. And truly, levodopa does have a short half-life, and so it probably has to do with how much dopamine you're producing versus how much you're using from medication. So I really don't like to say that medication doesn't work because it does, you know, always work, but it's different over time. Um, so I, don't, I won't get too far into that since that's not the topic for today. But we are very careful to test our, um, do our assessments at the same time of day so that things like if someone feels better in the morning versus the afternoon, that isn't the reason that they're doing better. Or, you know, that we're testing them at their peak best time of medication versus in time that they're off. So we're very careful about that because that's very important um, when looking at these results for people with Parkinson's is, you know, controlling for those kinds of factors as much as possible. So Dennis, these two videos are at the same time of day. He actually is on the same amount of medication and his DBS, I see a question here, is he using his DBS? Yes, his DBS is on and functioning. Um, he, they have tried making some slight adjustments to his DBS settings over time, but typically it hasn't ended up being better. So he's pretty much been on stable settings with his DBS um, since I met him. They've tried slight tweaks, but there's not many changes. And his medication, actually, his medication amount is the same as it was um, seven years ago as well. So his timing, his dosage, all of that is the same, which again, that's pretty unique. That's not what most people experience. Most people need to take more and more medication over time. Um, so that's, you know, to show this video on the right side, it's two years late or two and a half years later, he's walking faster, um, better, longer steps. And you can see he has a little bit of dyskinesia on his left ankle in February, 2017. That is also better. There's still a little bit there, but he is more stable, which obviously is going to help, um, a lot in terms of walking, uh, to be more stable on that left leg. So another question I see is how to handle leg cramps when using the treadmill. So it's tough because we kind of have to figure out why that's happening. Um, one way that I would handle that is, you know, medication optimization. So are the leg cramps really only happening on the treadmill or is that happening in relation to your medication cycle throughout the day? We, in some cases, need to walk on the treadmill, you know, take advantage of kind of your best time of day with regards to medications or just how you feel overall um, and do our exercise during that best time. So sometimes it's a matter of scheduling. Sometimes it's a matter of uh, just having enough medication in your system. Sometimes it's hydration or other like lab values might need to be looked at by your doctor to make sure you're not low in you know potassium or other things. Sometimes supplements can help. Um, also what we do is we do like when someone first starts on the treadmill and maybe they're able to walk for like three minutes at a time before they start having cramp cramping or some symptoms, we do three minutes. And then I have a chair I just put on the treadmill. They sit down, they take a rest break. When they drink some water, when they feel better, they stand up. We do three more minutes. So, you know, do whatever amount you can and take rest breaks as needed. Even a standing rest break, stop the treadmill, stretch. Um, stretching can definitely help um, or even seated rest breaks. And what you want to do is track, you know, how much you're able to do. So on, you know, Monday, you're maybe able to do five minutes without cramps. See, the next day, can you do six minutes? I think for some people, it can feel painfully slow to try to like increase by one minute at a time. But I had a gentleman who first, he wanted to be able to do the elliptical. The first time he got on, it nearly killed him. He did like three minutes and then he could, he like had trouble walking afterwards. His legs were so tired. Um, it was really challenging. And so we literally, we would do the, he was um, doing the bike otherwise, and he had worked up his time on the bike. So we would have him do the elliptical first for whatever amount of time he could do. Our goal was to increase 
um, his time by one minute each day or maybe two minutes on some days. And then whatever amount of time he had left with the goal of doing like 40 to 45 minutes, he would then do on the bike. So that's what we do when we move to a more challenging piece of equipment is we do it for a short amount of time. And then whatever other other piece of equipment someone's using, we use that for the remainder. Um, or when someone's first starting, they may start with 10 minutes. And then the next day we try to do 12. And then we try to do 14. So we just slowly work our way up over time. Um, but it doesn't help you to, you know, really push through that or exercise in pain. You know, we definitely want to address that because um, there's, there's an underlying reason for that. And if it is just your fitness level, that's something we can work on by just, you know, kind of taking it slow as we increase over time. Um, next question, what have we found versus elliptical versus a Stairmaster versus treadmills? And that you have both of those in the home. So that is awesome that you have both of them. So there's a lot of factors that go into my thought process of what piece of equipment I recommend for people. One is um, bikes are very safe um, pieces of equipment to use. So most people, a, a stationary bike is access accessible. Um, in terms of an elliptical or Stairmaster versus treadmill, one thing we look at is, you know, what is your preferred piece of equipment? If there's something that you like using and you are going to use it more often, that's an important factor. Um, but pr if I had to choose one piece of equipment, treadmills would be my favorite because not not only is it exercise, but you're working on walking, which is a skill that for most people is affected by Parkinson's. So a bike is a great way to exercise, but for most people, they don't need to be able to ride a bike to live their life. And you know, an elliptical or Stairmaster, I, I like them very much for exercise, but they don't necessarily train that skill of walking in the same way. So treadmill would be my first choice in most cases. If for some reason that isn't safe for someone though, like for some people an elliptical is better. Some people who have freezing on a treadmill, they're able to do the elliptical and because you're not having to lift your feet up and stretch them out, you're on pedals, people are able to do better on an elliptical than on a treadmill. So in that case, I would start with um, the elliptical and build up someone's endurance and then start to try to do the treadmill and work through that freezing in a safe way. So unfortunately, um, there aren't, in most things, there aren't like a super simple answer, but if you have both in the home and you like using both, then I would say focus slightly more time on the treadmill, but use the elliptical or Stairmaster as kind of your cross training to do something that's a little bit different, keep things interesting, because just doing the exact same thing all the time, a lot of people find that to be a little bit boring as well. Um, so hopefully that answers your question there. And then is there a guideline for exercise intensity versus endurance versus fatigue? Uh, not that I know of. It doesn't mean that there isn't one that exists, but for me, it's really like each individual person, it's based on what, you know, when they come, what they're able to do. Sometimes it's based on when we actually do their assessment and testing, what we're trying to accomplish um, or what we're trying to accomplish with that exercise. There is a lot of information about exercise intensity, and so I'm gonna bring that up a little bit later with some research. Um, and endurance, I would say, uh, there is, how those, obviously how those interplay make a big difference. For a lot of people, if you're working at really high intensity, how long you're gonna be able to do that is a little bit lower, versus if you work at a more low to moderate intensity, you can go longer. So I don't think there's anything really structured out there that you could read and just say, oh, I know for sure what I should be doing. Um, you need to listen to your body. If fatigue is something that's really interfering with your ability to exercise, that is something to pursue. Is it that your medications need to be adjusted um, so that you feel better? Is it have to do with your actual sleep? Are you not sleeping well enough at night? And that's affecting you. So if fatigue is really interfering with exercise, you need to investigate that and see kind of what is going on so that that can be addressed. Um, and then my preference in terms of exercise intensity versus endurance is to focus a little bit more on endurance first. And this is not something that's necessarily proven by research, but it's something that kind of from my experience, um, kind of clinical background, I find that what I usually focus on with people is safety and quality of movement first, and then we go for endurance. So then we go for being able to exercise for longer periods of time, and then we build up the intensity level. So in my experience, if people go too hard in terms of the intensity levels, and they don't have the endurance that's kind of the foundation to be able to do that kind of exercise for longer periods of time, they are limited and they kind of can sort of burn out 
or not feel well, feel worse after exercise. And although with high intensity exercise, you should feel tired afterwards, that's totally normal. You should not feel bad. So, I mean, a lot of people will say they're in pain after exercise or they feel bad or, you know, their medications don't work as well. That to me is a warning sign that we need to back off in terms of intensity a little bit, build up your endurance more, and then take that intensity level up again. Um, so hopefully that helped. And then any of these questions, if I don't really answer to a full extent, um, we can discuss more at the end. And then I also have my email address on here. So if anybody has follow-up questions that we don't get to, um, you can ask me over email as well or I can figure out what's the best way to communicate with you guys, or I can come back again and we can do more. We can do this again. Cause I love, this is what I love talking about. So I'm happy to um, be a resource. So another exciting um, demonstration of what is possible is this woman named Terry. Um, if any of you follow me, I do um, usually right now, I'm not posting as much these days, but I do post a lot on social media, on Facebook and Instagram, my clients exercising or their experience pre, you know, pre post and seeing benefits. So some of you may have seen Terry because a couple of her videos have gone kind of viral for us where they, you know, really got spread and people are excited um, to see what she was capable of. So when I first started working with Terry, it was also around, I think that 2013 timeframe, um, she had had Parkinson's, she was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2009. So it was a few years in, she was not taking medication at the time and she really had slowed down. So she was having more bradykinesia, some difficulty like getting in and out of the car and opening heavy doorways and things like that. So she came to physical therapy. Um, and also it was, she actually had pain in her foot. So she thought she had maybe arthritis. I think it showed to be a stress fracture. So that was actually the reason that got her to physical therapy, even though she needed um, to address Parkinson's, but it was actually that pain in her foot that got her to come. And so not only did we address that pain, which was um, partially due to how she was walking. So she was landing kind of with her feet flat and her feet are not meant to be landed on flat. We're, we're designed kind of to land on our heels. That is a strong bone that is um, kind of, you know, has evolved to really be able to wear, bear the weight when we land on it. And then we kind of rock through our foot. So if you're landing on the middle of your foot or the front of your foot, when you walk, that's going to be uncomfortable and can cause pain or other problems. And Parkinson's does tend to shorten up steps. So it's a pretty common thing for people to, you know, have some shuffling or be landing differently on their foot. So once we started to be able to get her to land on her heel, her foot got better. And then we started to be able to address the changes that she was experiencing due to Parkinson's. So she also continued exercising, and then um, we started to add more and more classes that we were doing our classes in the community. And one day she decided that her goal was to be able to jump rope. And I think we had done a little bit of jump roping in class or something that day, which jump roping is hard. There's a lot of people that jump roping is not the, necessarily the best form of exercise for them or is very challenging. Um, but Terry tried that day, and she wasn't able to jump rope. And instead of saying like, you know, oh, well, I have Parkinson's, I'm not going to be able to do this, or, you know, I'm not even going to try. She said, this is going to be my new goal. I'm going to, I want to try to learn to jump rope. And I said, okay, you know, I didn't know what was possible. I didn't know if she was going to be able to do that or not, but I don't think it's my job as a physical therapist to tell someone that they can't do something. I know a lot of people tell me, like my physical therapist told me I can't do that, or, you know, I should know that I'm going to get worse because I have Parkinson's. And if you are getting negative information like that from a healthcare professional, you need to find a new one because I don't know what's going to happen for anyone. We know what is typical for Parkinson's, but we're trying to, you know, show what is actually possible. And so I loved Terry's um, attitude and wanting to set a challenging goal for herself. And the other unique thing is that she let me videotape her when she was not able to jump rope. So most people don't want to be in video on video not doing something. Um, but Terry has been very generous and allowed me to videotape her. I would highly encourage you guys to videotape yourselves um, walking, moving, doing something that you have a goal. You know, when you decide to exercise more or do something differently, you know, videotape yourself and then videotape yourself later because improvement usually happens kind of slowly over time. And sometimes you don't realize how much you've improved unless you see yourself on video. Um, so it's really, I love, I think video is so powerful for me, for the people experiencing those benefits, and then be able to share those positive images and videos with other people so they can see, you know, some, someone else is able to do this. Maybe I can too, and it's worth trying. Um, so I'll show this video. So Terry in 2016 was not able to jump over the rope. She was able to swing the rope and then she could step over one at a time. 
So she let me videotape her doing that. And then she exercised a lot. She um, was exercising uh, right around five days a week, um, doing some walking outside of classes as well. We did not do a lot of jump roping. So I like to get better at a skill is not necessarily to try to do that thing, especially jump roping if you're not able to jump over it. If you just keep pushing that over and over, you may or may not expect ex experience a change. We do, you know, boxing classes, circuit classes. She was walking on a treadmill. We started doing incline so that she had more strengthening to walk uphill, you know, something like a stair climber. Um, then we started doing supported jumping. So holding on to something and jumping. So that gives your body the stability it needs to start to push those boundaries. So we did all sorts of things, not including jump roping. We really don't do a lot of jump roping um, because it's a hard exercise. Not everyone can do it. Um, and we really try to do, you know, things here that pretty much everyone can do some um, version of it. So you can see though, as she exercised, she started getting better. In December, 2016, she started being able to jump over one jump at a time. So she could swing that rope and jump over with um, both feet. I'm gonna start this video over again because that first clip is kind of a long clip. Bring it back to the beginning. Um, so by 2016, she could jump over with both feet at the same time. Then just a couple months later in February 2017, she was able to jump multiple times in a row. And then we have videotaped her every few months um, for, you know, it's been three, now, now it's been four years. <laughs> so it's been four years um, since June 2016, that first video. We have videotaped her every few months, so I've had different versions of this, but I just added in the most recent one on the right. So that was the last time I had asked her to jump rope here at the gym, was in December 2019. And after class, she was tired. I said, hey, let's try this. And she was like, I don't know, I'm kind of tired. And I was like, let's just try, you know, let's just see what happens. First attempt, boom, she jumps multiple times in a row. You can see she actually has a little bit better posture and is a little bit faster even than in February 2017. So even though she is older, she has had Parkinson's longer. Now she's had Parkinson's for 10 years. She is getting better at this skill over time. So I think it's really exciting to see that. All right, last one of the videos. I know I've talked a lot while playing these videos. After this, we'll be able to move a little bit more quickly through the slides. Um, but I do think this is probably the most important thing. You know, see someone who maybe does remind you a little bit of yourself or see them working through a challenge and see them get better. And, you know, just that idea in your head of, you know, I could get better too is the most important first step, you know, believing that that is possible. Because if you don't think you can get better, you can probably exercise a lot. But if you don't really think you can get better, it's probably a little less likely to happen. Our mind is very powerful. Um, and so your belief in what is possible is extremely important. Um, one more video I want to show is just a little bit of a different example, which is this gentleman who, at the time of these videos, he was in his mid-70s. Um, he had had Parkinson's for over 20 years already. He was taking medications, and he had also had deep brain stimulation surgery. Um, I, don't, I think in 2011 was when he had his surgery. Um, and I met him because he came to an exercise retreat that I volunteer at each year um, in Arizona with uh, Parkinson Wellness Recovery, that organization. So he and his wife came to the retreat and that's this video on the left. We're doing a drumming class in there, um, which is really fun. So I first met him become, because he came to the retreat and then he lived locally, he lived in Long Beach and I was teaching some classes at Cal State Long Beach at the time. So he started, he already was doing um, rock steady boxing twice a week in this first video. So he was exercising twice a week doing rock steady boxing. When he came back from the retreat, he joined my classes, which it was two days of aerobic exercise using equipment. So we would start on the treadmill, do as much walking as he could, and then we would use the recumbent bike. And then he did, a, he added a power moves class. Um, so power moves are amplitude based exercises um, that really directly focus on some of the changes that can occur with Parkinson's. So he joined those classes, so, and he kept doing rock city boxing. So he was now exercising five days a week, doing three different types of classes. Um, and he came in to volunteer for a course that um, I was teaching at Cal State Long Beach. And I was like, hmm, he looks good. I wonder, like, wonder how different that is. So luckily, I have like, like 10,000 videos on my phone, actually. So I could swipe back to the retreat where I had gotten some video of him and look and see that how much his posture had changed. So he, you know, already had had Parkinson's over 20 years. Um, he was having back pain. He was having freezing. His balance was affected. 
expected, which all makes sense. When you see kind of how he's standing, it makes sense that those things would be occurring. And those were significant challenges for him. And in classes, like when he came to walk on the treadmill, it was not easy. He was working very hard to take big steps and he needed constant reminders to lift his feet up and step forward. Um, and in power moves, he really struggled with the power moves. We get down on our stomach, on all fours, on our back. We do lots of exercises on the floor and they were very challenging for him. So, you know, he, I would say he was working hard and things didn't really get easy for him over that time period. But then when you see the difference in his posture here, to me, it is stunning. Like, like posture is something that is very difficult to improve, um, you know, through exercise, through physical therapy. It is something that has been changing in a negative way for most people for years. And so that's something that I would say is, is really tricky to improve. But here we see this amazing example. Like he looks like a different person. The shape of his body has changed. And he also had not had any like changes in his DBS or medication. All of that was stable over this course of a year. And yet, and you know, I don't know how much changes in those treatments. I've never seen it like make someone go totally vertical. Um, but definitely medication optimization and DBS settings are very important. Um, but really, like I believe it was mostly the exercise that helped him experience this benefit. And it's just amazing how much different he looks. Um, and I can tell you like all along, I, his wife, he didn't notice that change occurring until we put these videos side by side. And then we were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, so that's another example of, you know, just kind of a different situation. So we have Dennis who had more of that experience of freezing and festinating. Um, and that was his main challenge and that has improved. And then we had Terry who was more the symptoms of bradykinesia, slowness of movement, small movements were really affecting her function the most. That got significantly better. And then here an example of someone where their posture could change so much. Um, and I have tons more videos, but I can't, you know, I have, I'm already way over the time that I intended to um, talk about these. So you got to try to limit it somehow. Um, but I do post lots of videos on social media if you want to go see other videos um, and, you know, be the next pre-post. So take some video of yourself doing something now and then, you know, rededicate yourself to exercise. I think a lot of people have noticed, um, you know, with the pandemic and being restricted at home, not ex doing our normal exercise, not even, you know, doing our normal activities that, you know, that for many people has affected their Parkinson's, but that doesn't mean it can't, you know, change going forward. So every day is a new day to decide I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to push myself more. I'm going to attend more classes online. I'm going to walk outside or I'm going to, you know, get a treadmill at home. If that's an all an option or a bike at home, have something that no matter what is going on in the environment, you can still do the exercise um, that's going to help you. So, you know, figure out today what you can do. So that's really just, you know, talking a little bit about my experience from physical therapy to exercise. I think one-on-one -on -one physical therapy is very important. Um, that everyone should have access and do kind of an assessment and a bout of therapy on pretty much a yearly basis. Most insurance um, resets every year, and so you have access to more therapy through insurance, um, but then you have to be exercising consistently even when you're not in physical therapy. And even if you go to physical therapy, you should keep doing your exercise classes when you're in therapy. If you trade out and go to therapy and don't do your other exercise, you're not going to get the maximal benefit. So Yes, is it a big time commitment? Yes, um, you do have to carve out and figure out how to fit exercise in your life. But in my opinion, the benefits and how it's probably going to change your life, both in the short term and in the long term, is totally worth you know an hour or two per day. Um, I think for people who are still working, that is a challenge to really you know fit it into the schedule and work it around your work schedule. That is a unique situation, but. For many people with Parkinson's, they are retired um, and do have, you know, technically should have an hour or two in their day. Um, and that time investment really pays off. Um, moving from physical therapy and exercise, well, and actually I have a little bit of research I want to share with you guys. But I also started to see that there were a lot of other factors. What people were eating, you know, if people were saying, you know, I eat microwave cooked meals because that's what's convenient. I noticed that those people didn't tend to do as well compared to people who said, you know, I really make some food, you know, make food for myself from scratch and I make sure to eat enough fruits and veggies. So 
fueling your body, especially if you want to exercise intensely, you have to have the right fuel. And there's actually more and more research now coming out saying like what is important with regards to diet and that it may actually have an influence of how Parkinson's progresses over time. So nutrition is important and, and then other aspects of lifestyle are also really important. So I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, the I have some slides with research studies. I'm not going to talk really in depth about them. Um, but what I will do, like this is a review article um, from Dr. Eric Alscog, who is a movement disorders neurologist at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. He has his PhD and is uh, very experienced both clinically and he is a huge proponent of exercise, probably almost more so than any neurologist I know. He's actually publishing papers showing like this one is titled that it is that aerobic exercise, there is evidence for a direct brain effect to slow Parkinson's disease progression. You know, from the science, there is no treatment that we can really say very clear cut, you know, that slows Parkinson's progression. There's a lot of evidence that indicates that that is probably true. And that, in my experience, exercise definitely influences disease progression, but there's no research that really proves that. Um, research studies are somewhat small with exercise. They aren't necessarily long-term enough. Um, there can be a lot of variability, which I don't think is addressed. Um, it's really hard when you take a research study, you need to kind of implement things in a very systematic way. And that's not actually what people need in the real world. So there's a lot of limitations to research. But this review that he wrote, there, it's such a great one. And it's actually available free full text. So I will um, send the link for that to Jennifer and she can share it with you guys. So you can read that, you know, get excited about what is possible with exercise and share it with anyone else you know who has Parkinson's, your doctors, you know, they need to be seeing this so that they will, you know, help more and more encourage people to exercise. And you can kind of be a leader. If you are someone who's exercising, you can be the one to help, you know, spread this information. Um, but the conclusion, I won't read all of this text, but the conclusion from the evidence with tons of studies that he incorporated or included in the review is that regular aerobic type exercise tending to lead to fitness, so you really do have to experience a change in your fitness level, is the single strategy with compelling evidence for slowing Parkinson's disease progression. All patients with Parkinson's disease should be encouraged to engage in regular such exercise. Um, and so this it's just so great. It's so important. So I know I'm kind of like getting low on time. So I'm going to move through these kind of quickly. And I'm also happy to share my slides. I'll send the slides to Jennifer so that you guys can look back at these again. Let me know if you have any questions. This is another review article just talking about the potential motor and non-motor targets of aerobic exercise. So that's the cool thing about exercise is it kind of makes sense that it would help you get stronger or work on balance and then it would help with motor symptoms. But there's actually more and more research showing that um, exercise really can help with non-motor symptoms as well, which for a lot of people, non-motor symptoms are actually the most bothersome. So this review article talks about all these areas. So cardiovascular complications, um, which, you know, for someone, if they have Parkinson's and then they also go on to have, you know, have heart disease or have a heart attack, any additional diagnosis or, you know, health concern you have makes it harder and harder to um, deal with Parkinson's. So we want to keep you as healthy as possible aside from Parkinson's and have that be ideally the main diagnosis that you're having to um, work against. So cardiovascular complications. Parkinson's can affect the autonomic nervous system, so that can increase your risk slightly for other complications, but also just sedentary behavior, what you're eating, those things can put you at increased risk um, for other complications. So exercise is one of the best things you can do for that. Um, osteoporosis. Parkinson's itself does not um, affect bone density per se, but again, it's your activity levels. There's a lot of data to show that people with Parkinson's are less active than their um, peers who do not have Parkinson's. So just staying active um, is really important. And then exercise. So doing exercise where there is some, um, some impact, so something like jogging or jumping, if that's something that you're able to do, strengthening exercises where the tendons and your muscles are really pulling on the bone, those strengthening exercises have been shown to influence um, healthy bone and you know, keeping your bones strong. So osteoporosis is very important to be aware of because um, people with Parkinson's are at increased risk of falls. And if you have a fall and no injury, then it's not too big of a deal. But if you have a fall with an injury, with a fracture, you have to recover from that. It means a period of inactivity in most cases, and that is very significant. So we want to keep your bones as strong as possible. 
cognitive function. So cognitive changes are common with Parkinson's. It can really vary from some people who experience mild changes to people who do go on to have dementia. But I would say, you know, physical functioning is very important, but probably the most important thing is cognitive function. That is something that makes a huge difference for your independence and your life over time. And we want to really try to be proactive. Don't wait until you notice a cognitive change to try to do something about it. We want to implement, you know, therapies that are going to help and reduce your risk or really try to prevent or prolong the time until you experience a symptom like that. Um, and there's tons of research with exercise showing how it can improve all different aspects of cognition. Prevention of depression. So depression is common in Parkinson's. Um, both it, there can, that can be related to chemical changes and also, you know, the knowledge and the stigma that can come along with Parkinson's or the fact that you're constantly worried about how and when things might progress over time or what does your life look like in the future. So that's very common, but exercise is extremely helpful for depression. And actually there are studies, I don't know about necessarily in Parkinson's disease, I mean, people with Parkinson's specifically, but there are um, studies in people with depression where they compare exercise to pharmaceutical medications and show that exercise is just as effective or in some cases more effective than pharmaceutical medications. Um, I am all for taking the medications that are necessary for you to do your best. So in that case, if you're taking an antidepressant, exercise will probably just afford you additional benefits beyond what that medication does. Improved sleep. Sleep dysfunction is very common for people with Parkinson's and is extremely um, detrimental. If you are not getting good sleep, that is going to affect pretty much every aspect of your life. And so it's very important to address that, figure out what's going on with your sleep, what can you do about it. And exercise is really helpful. Exercise for one will help you stay more alert during the day. So you're less likely to be tired or have daytime sleepiness or take, you know, too long of a nap during the day that then gets you off schedule for your sleep schedule at night. Um, so exercise during the day helps wake you up during the day and also helps wear you out. So the more tired you get during the day by exercising and staying active, the better you're going to sleep at night. And then you can start to experience a positive um, cycle as opposed to a negative cycle with not sleeping well, being tired during the day, not feeling up to exercising, feeling worse, not sleeping well the next night it can be a really slippery slope um, to huge challenges. So sleep is something that is really important to try to optimize and exercise helps with that. Constipation, digestive changes are common for people with Parkinson's. Exercise helps keep things moving, which also helps your medications work better. If you are constipated and have slow motility and things are moving slowly, that is one reason why medications don't work as well. So it may not be that medication doesn't work, but it may be that the medication is not getting to where it needs to be in your digestive tract to actually get absorbed. Your medication does not get absorbed in your stomach. It gets absorbed in your small intestine. And so if things are just staying in your stomach for a long time, it doesn't have the opportunity to get digested. So we need things to move. Um, so exercise helps with that. Decreased fatigue. So like I, I think I mentioned earlier, um, fatigue needs to be looked at as well. Does that have to do with sleep? Does it have to do with medications? Um, a lot of times if you are out of shape to start with, you know, when you first start exercising, you may experience a little bit more fatigue. Um, but over time, as you continue to exercise, most people report less fatigue and they feel better during the day and they have more energy. So exercise can really do that. It can improve your functional motor performance. So that's like, you know, your grip strength um, or your ability, functional motor performance. They're talking about maybe the tests that the neurologists do, um, looking at your movement speed and dexterity. Um, it can help with that. It can help your medications work better, both in the short term and in the long term. And it actually helps the dopaminergic system in your brain function better. So there is just so, so much that exercise um, can do for us. That's just one review article. So um, there are some really exciting research that has come out recently that actually shows that people with Parkinson's who exercise consistently, when they exercise, they actually produce more dopamine. So that is really like the holy grail of treatments is, you know, can, is there a treatment that actually helps people continue to make more of their own dopamine? And this is some of the first work that has ever shown that people actually produce more of their own dopamine. So the key factors are people have to be exercising consistently. In this study, people had to be exercising at least three hours a week. Um, and it was aerobic exercise specifically, so using a bike. Um, and then it was when they exercised, they produced more dopamine. So you have to be exercising consistently. And then when they exercise, they produce more dopamine right after that. 
So this is why, you know, a lot of people report that they feel better after they exercise and it may be the actual dopamine boost. And so then on a day, if you don't exercise, you're not getting that boost that day. So people say they feel better after exercise. They also say they feel worse when they don't exercise. Um, so it makes sense. I mean, there's a lot of factors. It's not just the dopamine, but this was one of the first studies to show that exercise actually um, helped people produce more dopamine, um, which is very exciting. Um, this study, and this is actually an animal um, model, so it's, this is not specifically in humans, but a lot of um, research has been able to be translated from human to animal model, or sorry, from animal to human models, especially with regards to exercise. Um, so this study showed that exercise um, induced neuroplasticity, reduced the accumulation of the toxic misfolded alpha-synuclein proteins. So exercise does not just help your heart be healthier, your lungs be healthier, it helps the connections in your brain be better, and it may actually be doing some of the very specific physiologic functions that we need um, because Parkinson's is this buildup of these alpha-synuclein toxic alpha-synuclein proteins, and that is one of the underlying kind of mechanisms of Parkinson's progression over time is that more proteins and them spreading throughout different parts of the brain. So if exercise actually reduces that accumulation and helps your cells be more healthy, that is huge. Like these are the types of studies that are being done um, to, you know, very expensive research studies to try to find different types of treatment, whether it's a medication or a vaccine, um, you know, studies that it costs a lot of money to do these studies. It takes a long time to do these studies because they have to first make sure they're safe and then check and see if they're effective and then go to a phase three big study um, and recruit a lot of people into that study. And those take years. Um, and so while this research is happening, you know, I'm excited for the next big breakthrough that hopefully there is a, you know, a treatment that stops the progression of Parkinson's or reverses symptoms um, or prevents it from progressing. There's a lot of you know, exciting research happening, but in the meantime, while we wait for that research to you know, be completed and be published and you know, make it out to be available for the public, there are things you can do right now to accomplish those same types of things. Um, so you don't have to wait for that next huge breakthrough. You can be your own breakthrough right now with exercise. I'm getting all fired up. Um, what is the best exercise intensity to slow disease progression? So this study specifically, they were doing treadmill training, um, but they looked at a lot of the exercise research that shows that high intensity is important is having people work between somewhere between 60 to 80% of heart rate max. So that's kind of considered aerobic exercise. You're getting your heart rate up, um, but different studies are kind of inconsistent as to where exactly in that range. So th there's a big difference between 60 and 80% of heart rate max. So for me, first step is to try to get above 60. And then we know, you know, we should be getting some of those benefits of aerobic exercise. But in this study, they actually wanted to see if we split people up and have one group of people work in that 60 to 65% range versus another group that works in the 80 to 85% range, it, will that be different? Um, so this study, like I said, it was treadmill training. It was a six month study. So people were exercising for six months. Um, and they had one group was randomized to work at 80 to 85%. They were wearing heart rate monitors and exercising three times a week. Um, I believe the high intensity portion was about 30 minutes and they had like 10 minutes to warm up and cool down before and after. Um, another group at 60 to 65% and then usual care. So basically not doing any formal exercise because unfortunately that's what usual care is right now that people are not really encouraged and supported in doing high intensity exercise. Um, so what they showed over the six months, this is a change in the UPDRS score. So the UPDRS is the assessment that um, neurologists and physicians use to measure your motor symptoms and potentially look at some other symptoms as well. But this is specifically the motor symptom score. So over six months, people in the usual care group had an increase in their score on average of 3.2. In the um, kind of more moderate intensity, they had a change of 2.0 and the highest intensity was only 0.3. So there's a statistically significant difference between the groups and the people at the highest intensity had the least change over um, that six month period. So basically that supports that exercise may be actually influencing the progression um, of Parkinson's over time. So this study has allowed them, they have now applied for additional funding. I think they're going to do a bigger study and hopefully track people over a longer period of time um, because six months is still a relatively short amount of time. But still, this is significant. Um, I also wanna note that 
this intensity level was not something where people came in on day one and did 80 to 85% heart rate max for 30 minutes. They actually had a two month time frame of working people up from not exercising at all to being able to do these higher intensities. So there was kind of a two month training period for people to improve their fitness levels and be able to figure out like, you know, how hard do I have to be pushing? What does it feel like to do this 80 to 85% of heart rate max? Um, so lots of things, but basically exercise was shown to be very effective there. So let's make it happen. I know you guys hear from Jennifer and from your neuroboxing coaches all the time, you know, that exercise intensity is important. You have to push yourself. Um, and this is important both, I kind of look at the intensity from both two perspectives. One is that for people with Parkinson's, Parkinson's kind of causes people to move slower and smaller. So one, we just have to really on more of a skill-based level, you've got to train to move bigger and faster. So that alone is going to help you move better. But then that intensity is also relative to your heart rate um, and how intensely you're exercising. And um, like boxing classes and things like that can be very good at getting your heart rate up. But in my experience, I found that it can be somewhat inconsistent. So some people are really able to get their heart rate up very high in classes like that. But some people whether it's they have more bradykinesia or they have more of a balance challenge or there's cognitive challenges that kind of interfere, like boxing classes and circuit classes can be very dynamic. And so in my experience, sometimes the, all the different types of things you need to do, just remembering and keeping track of it and then trying to push yourself, it's hard to work so hard consistently to keep your heart rate up. So in my experience, circuit and boxing classes kind of can be, you know, certain exercises you're getting your heart rate up, but then certain exercises, if you're working on cognition or balance or posture, your heart rate may not be up as high. So I think to really take this research and try to implement it in the real world, it's very important to actually use heart rate monitors to measure and see, are you able to get your heart rate up? Um, if not, why not? You know, what do we need to do differently? We started using heart rate monitors um, just relatively recently. It's not something we've been doing for a long time, but I was excited to get them. And so we noticed that, you know, different classes um, were, had higher or lower levels of intensity. And even for an individual, some individuals were able to get their heart rate up better in some classes than in others. So that really allows us to be much more sophisticated and actually use the research even more to guide what we're doing in classes. And so we did take like our circuit class, we modified it a little bit with this information. And now instead of before we had, you know, 10 circuits of all different skills working on strength, balance, flexibility, mobility, um, agility, all different things. And I found people were not really getting their heart rate up and keeping it up consistently. So we adjusted our class where now we basically go back and forth and every odd rotation is a high intensity rotation. We are doing things specifically with the goal of getting the heart rate up. That might be jumping jacks or squat jumps or lunges. You know, it depends on the person what that is a little bit but we want to keep things simple cognitively and kind of simple physically, not use a lot of extra equipment. We want to focus just on getting the heart rate up. And then our even um, rotations are skill-based rotations. So that's where we're working on posture, flexibility, balance, and other type cognition, other types of skills. So we're going back and forth during our class between high intensity skill, high intensity skill. And so people get their heart rate up during that high intensity. And then as they rotate to the next one, they're able to keep their heart rate up a little bit better. And then they go right back to that high intensity one. So we have made adjustments in how we do our classes based on this information. Um, so first you want to you know, A, check and see. If you do have any history of cardiovascular diagnoses, heart attack, you want to approach things a little bit slower. You still can work to get your heart rate up, but you need to be careful of any other diagnoses that you have um, that may relate to your ability. If you have a pacemaker or if you're on blood pressure medication that is specifically to lower your heart rate, that may affect your ability to get your heart rate up. Um, so there's some things like that to take into consideration. Um, then you want to calculate and see though, based on your age and your resting heart rate, what is um, kind of this range for you? So, you know, 60% of heart rate max for me is I think somewhere like 130 or 140. Um, up to 80% is more like 150. So the older you are, the um, lower that percentage is going to be. So the younger you are, the higher your numbers are. Um, so I think for a lot of our clients, it's around like 100 or 110 beats per minute is the 60% up to maybe like 120. Um, so it's ideal to do that calculation for you as an individual. And then wear a heart rate monitor during classes, whether you get one of your own 
Um, you can use an Apple Watch for that. You can use a Fitbit, other activity monitors. Um, or you can get an actual like, you know, heart rate monitor that's specifically just made to measure that and use an app to measure. Um, and see, you know, are you able to get your heart rate up? Our experience, we actually were posting, you know, we got some TVs and we were using an app so that we could see everybody's heart rates during class. And everybody found it very motivating and was, were pushing themselves to work harder because of what they saw. So for one, just wearing the heart rate monitor and seeing your data may help you get up to those levels. If you're doing classes though and you find I'm really never able to get my heart rate up, then I would really recommend that you supplement those boxing classes and other types of classes that you might do with some straight aerobic exercise using pieces of equipment. And then see, again, measure on those pieces of equipment. What do you have to do to get your heart rate up? Can you keep it up? What does that feel like? Um, based on the research, what I would say is that we, with that high intensity study that had people, but you know, that did better between 80 to 85% of heart rate max, we um, want to have at least 90 minutes per week of that really high intensity, if at all possible. And again, you're not going to do this immediately if you haven't been doing it already. It's something you need to work up to. So you need to do it safely, but that would be your eventual target is to try to get up to 90 minutes during the week of that really high heart rate, um, as long as that's safe otherwise. And then I would say the other research where it was more in the 60 to 80% heart rate max range, we want about three hours of that total. So that 90 minutes you're getting counts in those three hours. So if you're getting 90 minutes of 80 to 85%, then you would want like another 90 minutes per week that's at least above 60. Um, but it doesn't have to be max intensity. Um, I don't find in real life, um, and physiologically, I don't even think it's a good idea to do extremely high intensity every single day. You need to vary up your exercise, keep it interesting, allow your body to recover. Um, so doing this higher intensity, probably like three times a week is a good idea. And then you wanna have some moderate intensity exercise that you do, and then even some low intensity exercise, um, which I would consider things like a lot of yoga classes, Tai Chi, Qigong, um, Pilates, something like that to be more low intensity. Um, so you wanna really mix up your program. All, of, all the different types of exercise have their own benefits. So just a quick picture. I know I'm, oh my gosh, way over time. Jennifer, feel free to interrupt me if we need to. I am getting close though. I just have a few more slides. Um, so as long as you guys are okay for us to keep going, and I think we're still, it's still happening. I'm not like talking to myself here, um, but sorry to go over. I think I can wrap up in just a few minutes if that's okay, Jennifer. That's okay. This is, and okay. you're getting closer to the end, so that's okay. Yeah. okay I think thank you. Uh, it's, yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Yeah. I tried, I promise, I really tried to have this be like a 30 minute presentation and have time for questions afterwards, but clearly I just have no ability to do that. So that's something I need to work on. Um, so here it just shows on the left is using an app where we all have heart rate monitors on and we were seeing um, our names and our um, what our heart rate was. And then the circle is basically showing a percentage. So if you were below 60% heart rate max, you're in gray. Once you're between 60 and 70, you're in the blue zone. Between 70 and 80 was the green zone. And if you're above 80, you're in the orange zone. So we were able to see pretty easily both by the, the color that our name was in and then also that percentage in the circle, what range we were in and really be able to use this to exercise better. Um, and it goes both ways. There are some people, I've had clients who you know exercise and then they feel terrible afterwards. They feel worse. And that is not what's supposed to happen with exercise. So putting these monitors on, there is a chance that you actually are working too high of an intensity and it, that you're not going to feel good after exercise. Feeling tired is okay. Um, feeling a little bit sore and kind of worn out is okay, but you should not feel bad. Um, so this allows us to really optimize exercise in both directions. And if you are working you know, too intensely at times, I would also say what you need is just to incorporate more aerobic exercise more consistently throughout your week so that when you go to do that high intensity, your body can handle it better. Um, and then on the right is just the picture. These are the heart rate monitors um, that we're using. They are, Skosh is the brand. Um, they're on the arm, so it's easy to put them on and off um, and clean them. Truly, we won't be using them initially when we get back. We're not back to together in classes yet, and we won't be using those right away because we're really limiting you know, the amount of stuff that we use and touch with other people. But eventually, hopefully, we'll be able to get back to using those. Or maybe what we'll have to do is just, you know, have people have one that is their own and they can wear it and take it home with them. Um, and that way we could still use the app and still monitor in class. Um, so if people can purchase these for themselves and we could keep doing this kind of monitoring 
um, even if we're not able to use our monitors. So um, this is just a picture showing that, you know, when people say, what kind of exercise should I do? You really want to do aerobic exercise where you're getting your heart rate up, and then you want to do skill-based exercise. Um, and this figure just shows what those two types of exercise do. So aerobic exercise is more for brain health. It helps you release trophic factors. It increases blood flow up to your brain. Uh, Skill-based exercise really improves the circuitry of your brain and synapses and connection between neurons. And then when you do those two types of exercise together, that's when you get the most benefit. So something like boxing can definitely be both, um, but we just have to measure and see because the more challenging the boxing is, the more skill there is, a lot of times that means that it's harder to get your heart rate up because you're focusing so much on trying to learn and do things the right way. And on the flip side, if you're just going kind of crazy in terms of intensity level, the quality of your exercise may not be as good. So we really want to kind of find a good balance between those. Um, and so boxing is a great form of exercise that accomplishes both, but it's still a little more kind of complicated than, than just saying, okay, boxing is, we'll just do boxing and, you know, no to be able to know whether or not that's really accomplishing everything, um, we wanna look at it a little bit closer with like heart rate monitors. Um, so these are just those definitions of aerobic exercise and what it does and what some examples are, skill-based exercise. And like I said, this is a continuum. So it's not that like aerobic is only on one side and you have to use a piece of equipment and skill-based is you know not using equipment. There is a lot of, um, it's a spectrum. And boxing is one of the great forms of exercise that really kind of can accomplish both. Um, and then there's lots of other great forms of exercise as well. And I think there's a lot of other good things like the power moves that are a great form of exercise to do in addition that are complementary to boxing workouts. How much do you need to exercise? So this is some great research um, from Dr. Mishley, who is a naturopath up in Seattle. She is doing a study called the CamCare study, um, looking at lifestyle factors for people living with Parkinson's out in the real world what are they doing and what are they experiencing um, based on the choices they make for their life? So one of the questions she asked is regarding exercise, how many of the last seven days did you do at least 30 minutes of exercise? And so people are filling out um, an assessment called the Pro-PD, which is a self-assessment that you guys can do. And I can send the website for that as well. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. Um, it's a self-assessment. So it asks about a number of different symptoms related to Parkinson's, even some side effects with medication. And it's a way that you can kind of test yourself. It is somewhat subjective because you're filling it out, but it is a little bit more subjective than you just saying like, I have this symptom or this thing bothers me because each symptom you rate on a scale of zero to 100 or there's basically a slider bar. So a zero is you don't experience that symptom at all or it's not bothersome. 100 is you experiencing, experience it, it's very bothersome, it really affects your life. So each of those you go and slide. And so they get a score on the Pro-PD that is correlated to the UPDRS and quality of life measures and other measures that are used for people with Parkinson's. Um, so it is a really great measure and it's something that you can do for yourself. You don't have to wait to see a neurologist or see a physical therapist or you know, go to your classes and have that assessment done um, as part of your classes. You can do this yourself. So they use that as a way to measure the effectiveness of exercise and how consistently people needed to exercise. So what they found is that if people were exercising two or less days per week, it basically did not have any influence on Parkinson's. Um, I would argue, you know, any exercise is better than no exercise, but if we are really trying to influence the progression of Parkinson's over time, it is not a one or two day a week kind of thing. It has to happen more consistently. So as soon as people got to exercising three days a week, there was a significant difference in their symptoms. People were doing significantly better than average on that Pro-PD score when they were exercising at least three days a week. And there was additional benefit for each additional day that people were exercising. So um, four days was better than three, five was better than four, et cetera, all the way up. So, I mean, people usually want to find out what's the least amount I can exercise to get the most benefits. And unfortunately, that's just not really how it works. Um, it requires consistent exercise, exercising multiple days of the week, ideally more than three. And so what I tell people is you really have to target, in my opinion, exercising at least five or six days per week. Because if you have a goal of exercising three days a week and one or two of those days you don't feel well, you are going to fall underneath that threshold and be exercising two or less days per week, which is probably not enough to really impact your Parkinson's. 
So you need to have a target of five or six so that if you do miss a day or two, you're still in that range um, of doing enough exercise for it to benefit you. So that um, research is very helpful to guide us because otherwise exercise research doesn't really compare dosage of exercise. They say, okay, everybody's going to exercise three days a week and that's beneficial, but is two days a week beneficial or not? Is four days a week better? There wasn't really a lot of research to guide us until this um, research was done. Uh, this study is just showing as well, they took the same exercise program and they had people either complete it as a home exercise program on their own or um, in a group setting or in one-on-one -on -one with a therapist. And so what they saw is that when people exercised on their own, you know, without, this was like, you know, exercise on a paper. I don't even think it was like a video to exercise with. It was just, you know, here's a list and some pictures of the exercises, just go through and do this on a regular basis. They basically showed that that did not have any positive benefits for people. So I think it's really important for people with Parkinson's and other neurologic conditions to work with someone, a coach, a physical therapist, a trainer. So someone's there to give you feedback and make sure you're doing things as well as possible and keep things interesting and challenge you in a safe way. Um, so exercising just purely on your own at home is probably not going to change Parkinson's. So you may say like, I exercise on my own, you know, three days a week already, but I'm not experiencing these kinds of benefits. I think you need to be in a class so there's someone there to push you and challenge you and help you do more than you would do on your own. Um, then when people were, did it in a group setting, it was beneficial and they especially saw some positive changes with regards to balance and cognition. And I definitely think that exercising in a group, it, there's a lot to navigate. There's other people and what you're doing, you're paying attention, you're communicating. So there's so many benefits beyond just the exercise um, in a class setting. And then they showed for people working one-on-one -on -one with a therapist, they actually had the most improvement in physical testing of their balance and mobility. So this is support basically to say you really ideally want to have both. You want to have classes that you do on a consistent basis, and you also ideally want to work with a physical therapist um, at time points throughout the year, because that's where, you know, in physical therapy, they can really hone in on the specific things you need to be able to do better and differently to, again, really get the most out of the classes that you take on a regular basis. Um, so that's all the research that I'm sure you hear it all the time. You've got to work hard, get your heart rate up, you know, push yourself. Your coaches are telling you that. It is very important. Um, and now hopefully you see some of that really exciting research that is saying, okay, this is not just because we want to be bossy and tell you what to do or because we want to make you sweat. It's because this is the kind of exercise you need to do to change your brain. So last topic is that in addition to exercise, um, I do see that there are so many other aspects of wellness and things that you guys can do with regards to your lifestyle to really have the most benefit. Um, so I started looking into this because I did see that, you know, when people's nutrition was not ideal, that really affected their ability to exercise. Um, if their stress levels were too high, if they aren't sleeping, all of those really influenced how they felt overall. And it really affected their ability to exercise and access the benefits of exercise. So I um, started doing research and it's just things that I'm really interested in. So I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard of the Blue Zones. You can look it up. There's a website. I think it's bluezones.com. That's where I got this image from. Um, blue Zones are, it's been identified that there are places in the world where people live longer and are healthier. They have much less chronic disease. There's less diagnoses like Parkinson's or heart disease or diabetes. People live into like they're hundreds, they, a lot of people live, they're centenarians, they live over 100, and they are healthy and active while they're 101. Um, and so, yes, like there probably are some things like genetics obviously play some role in that, but they have identified these places in the world. There's at least nine locations. There's one in Costa Rica, there's one in Japan, there's one in Italy. And so they said, okay, what is unique? Because it's not just genetic, but what is unique about these people and their lifestyle that allows them to be healthy, and live you know, for so long and be independent. Um, and so what they found, they've identified very specific things that these communities have in common. They move, and here it's listed as naturally. So it's people who live in areas where they are very physically active throughout the day. That's just, you know, that's their lifestyle. They're making food from scratch, they're gardening, um, they're walking to you know, the shops. Um, the area in Italy is like in a very kind of mountainous region. And so there's lots of like walking up and down mountains, a lot less driving, a lot less sedentary behavior. So in the US, definitely the more you move naturally throughout your life, the better, but we have a lot of sedentary kind of 
uh, restrictions in our life that cause us to be more sedentary. So moving naturally is great, but I think also specific exercise is very important in our case. Um, they also found that people need to have a purpose. So why do you wake up in the morning? You know, if someone has doesn't have a purpose. Like they feel like when they wake up, it's just like, well, what am I doing with my day? Why does it even matter? That is really going to influence your longevity and how you feel. So uh, for a lot of people, you know, when you stop working, so many of us, our work is so a huge part of our identity. And when people retire, that really may change, or especially if you have Parkinson's and you're younger and you stop working earlier than you expected to, that may really change how you feel. And so it's something that's important to look and see, you know, what is the reason that I get up in the morning? What can I do with my life where I feel engaged and I have purpose? It may be giving back to others. It may be helping your family and supporting them. There's so many different ways you can find it, but it is, it's critically important. Um, they also found that what they call downshifting is important. So this is taking time to relax, um, allow for some stress relief, whether that is just quiet time or spending time in nature or maybe doing something like Tai Chi or gentle yoga class that really allows your system to kind of decompress and de-stress. That's very, very important. And most of these communities have um, like kind of within kind of their society, they have built in like the weekend is truly a time of rest or, you know, there are other things that are built into their lifestyle to really support this, which I think you know, in our society in the U.S., there's so much of like, go, 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 do, do, do all the time. And we don't necessarily take that time to downshift. And it's very important. The 80% rule has to do with eating. So there is an exact term, which I can't remember right now, where the goal is that you stop eating when you feel 80% full. And I would say that is not something that we uh, typically tend to ascribe to in the U.S. We tend to eat a lot and big meals and, you know, big portion sizes of things. So that's something they have found in common in these communities. So that's something you could integrate into your life as well. You could say, you know, instead of eating until I'm totally full or over full in some cases, I'm going to eat until I'm 80% full and then stop eating. And likely what you will experience is within the next hour, you probably will feel completely full. We um, tend to have a, um, you know, it takes a while for our brain to know that we're full. This can, I would say there is a caveat. Um, this is not specific research for people with Parkinson's. This is more just, you know, longevity research. With people with Parkinson's, there are some people who have a low appetite or have weight loss. And so, of course, we want to make sure that people are eating enough calories and eating enough food um, to maintain their weight and health. So this isn't going to just clearly, you know, be a one-to-one -one, um, comparison. But I think there's still a lot of information we can gain here about things that you could incorporate into your lifestyle. Um, number five is plant slant. So that also is related to eating. And that is that these communities tend to be more plant-based. They are not vegan completely. It's not that they never eat any animal products, but they eat a lot more fresh fruits, veggies, whole grains, legumes, beans, things like that. And there's more research to support that as well. So trying to shift away a little bit from animal products towards more plants um, is something that can be very beneficial for your health. Wine at five is the next one. So they actually show that communities that do drink some wine um, and have some social time in the evening, that's a benefit. So it doesn't mean, you know, that's obviously another thing that's on an individual basis. Um, I don't think wine is something that you have to have, but if it's something that you enjoy and you feel like it's a benefit to your life, as long as it's in moderation, this research shows that that can be positive. Um, the right tribe, you want to surround yourself with other people who are making good decisions with regards to health who have healthy behaviors, exercising, eating well, you know, being social. And so that's what classes can really provide um, for people with Parkinson's as well, is being around that group of people where you are influenced in a positive way. Um, next one is loved ones first. So really having an emphasis on family, intergenerational um, relationships has been shown to be very powerful and important, um, and a sense of belonging. And so a lot of these communities actually do have um, some faith based to them. It's not at one specific religion or anything like that, but having, you know, some faith and a community um, there can also be something that's very powerful for health. Um, so these are some of the things I think you could consider in addition to exercise um, for areas that you could incorporate into your life. The research that Dr. Mishley is doing, that CAM care study, is looking at some of these specific things and finding a lot of commonalities specific in people with Parkinson's. So in terms of the community, in her research, the most um, influential question that 
tells people whether they're going to have a better or worse quality of life or doing better or worse than average for how long they've had Parkinson's is if they answer, how they answer the question, are you lonely? So if people answer yes to the question, are you lonely, that has the most significant negative impact on average to people's score and how they're feeling. So, you know, this social piece is huge. Exercise is important. What we eat is important. But social lives is extremely, extremely important. Um, and with Parkinson's, it's very common for people to tend to withdraw from their social circles and not do as much over time. So that's something we really want to be proactive about. Um, and then her research shows that what we eat makes a difference and is related to the progression of Parkinson's over time. This study here was just published recently in May of 2020, showing that dietary antioxidants are associated with slower progression of Parkinson's signs in older adults. Um, so eating more fruits and veggies, that's where antioxidants come from. The colorful foods that we eat um, can actually have an influence on Parkinson's as it progresses. This is just a schematic of um, looking, these individual dots are people with Parkinson's. So this is their pro-PD score. A lower score is better. A higher score indicates more burden of disease and symptoms, and it was related to a worse quality of life. Here we're looking at how long someone has had the diagnosis. So this line in the middle is looking at um, kind of the average progression of Parkinson's over time. And so in her research, what they're looking at is who are these people out here that 20, 25 years after diagnoses are doing well, who have less symptoms, have a good quality of life? What are they doing differently in terms of their lifestyle so that we could, you know, tell other people, people who are up here, you know, what are they doing differently um, with regards to exercise, with regards to their social life, with regards to what they're eating, so that you guys can actually make decisions now based on how you, you know, how you're doing and make changes to your lifestyle to hopefully get you in this, in the area where you're functioning better than average and, you know, really feeling good, as good as possible for a long period of time after being diagnosed. That's the goal is basically to shift this whole line down and really try to have the progression of Parkinson's be extremely minimal for 20, 25 years. And there are people out there and there are differences. I mean, Parkinson's progress is different for each person. That is certainly true. But I still believe that lifestyle has a huge influence on that. And every person has the ability to influence how prog Parkinson's progresses over time. So a lot of the things she's looking at are similar to this and are lining up. Exercise matters. What you eat matters. Stress relief matters. These are all really important. Um, so with regards to food, um, I'm happy to come back and do another time where we go a little bit more in depth in her research and food. This um, is going to be quick, um, but you can look at this later. So she is looking at um, on a survey that people fill out every six months. They fill out what they're eating and how much. And then she's able to show how those foods and especially the number of servings that people eat, how that correlates to their symptoms. So on this picture here, basically in between the green and red is kind of average. And then the things that are in green are basically the things that if people are consuming those, they are doing better than average for how long they've had Parkinson's. These things in red are if people are consuming these, these things and especially the more servings you have per week, they're doing worse than average. So these are things that you could change on a daily basis. What are you going to eat or not eat to feel better and hopefully affect the, the progression of Parkinson's over time? So the things that are the most beneficial, starting from up top, which is the has the biggest influence, are fresh vegetables. So how many servings of fresh vegetables are you eating every day? If it's one or two, it is not enough. You really need to get those numbers of servings up. The next one is fresh fruit. So this really lines up with that research saying that you know, higher levels of antioxidants are going to be beneficial for progression over time. The next one is nuts and seeds. There's huge um, nutritional value in nuts and seeds. Um, fish is the only animal product that has been shown to be um, beneficial in her research. Um, it needs to be non-fried fish. Um, so like, yeah, fried fish is not, fried foods is not good for you. So non-fried fish, broiled, baked, sauteed, however you want to do it. Um, wine is also positive in her research, which lines up with the blue zones. Um, olive oil, which to me, if you think about what do you eat olive oil with, you don't usually put olive oil like on meat. Usually olive oil is going on vegetables. You're roasting vegetables, you're making a salad, um, things like that. So olive oil is beneficial, beneficial, coconut oil, and then fresh herbs. Um, the things that are on the negative side, we're going to start from the bottom. So these are the things that have been associated and correlated with the worst progression or the fastest progression over time. Canned fruit, which is surprising because 
you would think, you know, fruit is healthy, but there's a couple different hypotheses for why canned fruit might not be good. It might be the lining, there's BPA um, in some of the lining of canned food. Maybe it's the quality of fruit that goes in that can. Maybe it's a higher level of um, pesticide treated fruit. Maybe it's added sugar or the things that the fruit is in with. You know, it's not really known. There's nutrition research is very complicated. Um, so you don't always know like the exact reason why, but the truth is like it's correlated with worse outcomes. So if you're eating a lot of canned fruit, you might want to consider trying to shift that um, to more fresh whenever possible. Um, diet soda. We kind of all know diet soda is not really good for us, but it's actually correlated with faster progression of Parkinson's. Fried foods, ice cream, canned vegetables like canned fruit, beef, pasta, soda, so just regular soda, high sugar, that's not really great for us. Drinks in plastic bottles, um, chicken, pork, frozen vegetables, yogurt, cheese, and milk. So these are the foods that are associated with faster progression. Um, you may not have heard anything like this before. Most neurologists, if you ask them, they'll say, you know, a healthy diet is what's important. But it's like, well, what exactly is a healthy diet? What exactly does that mean? Um, the dairy thing is interesting. This is a whole other topic that I don't have time to go into much detail today. But there are already like seven studies that show that increased um, intake of dairy products are related to higher risk of getting Parkinson's. Um, and so now there's research that actually shows when someone does have Parkinson's that dairy products relate to faster progression. So there's kind of three different main hypotheses for why, why that might be true. Um, but these are things you can look and say, okay, on a daily basis, I'm going to really try to eat more of these things and I'm going to try to eat less of these things. So it's up to you. Or you may say, I don't want to change my diet. That's okay. It's, it's your life. You can decide what you do or don't want to do. Um, you can just keep eating whatever you want, or you could say, you know, I'm going to take this into consideration and make some changes to my diet. It is totally up to you. Um, last study just to talk about is um, a neurologist. I believe he is a neurologist by background. He's a physician. He is doing a novel therapeutic program for people with cognitive decline. So more within just the dementia world. Um, I think with neuroboxing, I know there are people not only with Parkinson's, but with other neurologic conditions. Um, and Alzheimer's and dementia is actually one of the most common diagnoses and reason for people to have dementia and is a huge burden to individuals, their families, and also the healthcare system. And right now, there is not a lot of um, effective treatment for cognitive decline, you know, separate from Parkinson's. So this doctor put together a therapeutic program. This is what it looks like. So people are asked to optimize their diet, minimize processed food, increase whole foods, especially plant-based foods. The goal is to enhance autophagy. So he's asking people to fast for 12 hours each night, which is not totally unreasonable. You know, if you start eating breakfast at 7 a.m. and you have dinner by 7 p.m. and try not to eat for 12 hours in between, that's not totally unreasonable, um, including three hours before bedtime is one of their stipulations. Um, reduce stress. So try to, you know, that's personalized, whatever form of stress reduction works for that person. Optimizing sleep, exercising, brain stimulation. So brain training using something like Brain HQ, which is an evidence-based brain training program. Um, and then they also look at a lot of other lab values and there are a lot of um, supplements in as part of this protocol, which, you know, they haven't compared and said, well, what if we just do lifestyle changes? How much does that do? Um, versus are these supplements really necessary? So we don't know for sure, but he has had some amazing results implementing this pretty um, strict uh, protocol for people. But there are people who've had a reversal in their cognitive symptoms, who had stopped working and went back to work. Um, and it's now something that is available clinically. Um, it is a very personalized program. So it's kind of hard to study in a big scale because not everybody needs the same treatment. And the less standardized your program is for research study, the harder it is to look at it and see if it's really effective. So again, this is one of the limitations um, for research. But these are the kinds of things, if you even just optimize your diet, try doing the 12 hour of fasting, reduce stress, optimize sleep, exercise, already I really believe that that could have a huge impact on how you feel um, and how you do over the long term. So these are things that are accessible to you now. So I will send these slides out so you could look and see, you know, at these nine things, what areas do you feel like you're doing really well and you're effective? What areas maybe aren't you doing so well and could be, could be better um, so that you have the opportunity to make those changes in your life? And it's something you know, that you can do on your own, you can do with the support of a professional if you need to work with a dietitian or nutritionist. 
um, or you need to go have a sleep study so that you can get better sleep. There's all sorts of things that you can do, but you can be proactive to really access the benefits. So, so sorry. Oh my gosh, that was way, way over, but um, I hope that that was beneficial information. Um, it's, that's my goal is I got to get better at these presentations and being able to condense the material. But, you know, I just get so excited about all of this and I ended up talking a lot more on those videos than I meant to. So apologies for going over. Um, I'm sure everybody's got plans and things to do. Although I guess right now with the pandemic, maybe a little bit less than normal. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I can stay on for a little bit if there's time, if Jennifer, if that's okay with you. Otherwise, um, you can email me. Um, if you want to ask a follow-up question, that's my email, claire at roguept.com, um, and our website, if you want to check that out, but definitely if you have any follow-up questions that we don't get a chance to answer, I'm happy to respond to those over email. Okay, thank you so much, Claire. We really, really appreciate you coming and giving this wonderful presentation. Um, so we're going to go ahead and...